Uh, what I wanted to talk about today are first off a couple of general safety updates that APBA uh, made at the national meeting this year. And then I also want to talk a little bit about life jackets and personal flotation devices as they relate to what we're doing here. And a little bit about air systems since we tend to get a lot of questions on those. Um, the first thing I wanted to hit was what the uh, safety rules are for 2013 that are updates. Uh, first off, I'm a member of the APDA Safety Committee uh, that was appointed to this as a factory rep for security race products. Uh, the Safety Committee consists of representatives from each category of APBA. It has a chairman appointed by the APBA president and its chairman is Christy Ellison. Uh, it also uh, has a person appointed from a, a rescue team as well. So there's a pretty broad representation. Lifeline also has a factory rep on the team. Uh, Sunny Hawkins from uh, Tiger is, is a member of the uh, committee. And there was a time in APBA when the safety committee was the committee nobody ever wanted to hear from because they could pretty much act unilaterally, pass things in APBA safety, and uh, that was it. It was a done deal, no questions asked. Uh, when APBA was reorganized a few years ago and the bylaws got changed, Basically, any rule change of APBA uh, has to go through the Board of Directors for final approval. And as such, the, the safety committee, in the eyes of a lot of people, lost some teeth there. Um, in, the, in the days that it was in the past, it was actually a good way to have it because it forced the categories to take more responsibility for owning and, and managing their safety rules because the the train of thought at the time was, if you don't change the rule, safety will change it for you. So the categories kind of stayed on top. Now it's kind of gone to a different type deal where uh, the safety committee, either through the categories or through members, gets recommendations. We talk about them. Uh, we make our uh, approvals and pass them on to the board of directors for final approvals. So that's what we did in Dallas about a month ago. And specifically, the changes that we made were some changes to the life jackets manufacturing specifications uh, to the A100 jacket. Uh, a or an A100 jacket is a life jacket that's worn by a driver who is not in a reinforced, restrained cockpit. So if you're an outboarder, if you're an inboard flat bottom without a capsule, if you're a vintage guy, if you're a a small OPC boat, um, if you're a super light tunnel boat, you've got an A or an A100 jacket. Uh, the changes that were specifically made for this year is as of pending board approval, which should happen very soon, A100 jackets will require impact material to be inside of them. Uh, the impact material is a hard uh, plastic material it's similar to what football shoulder pads are made out of when it's put into a life jacket it sits on top of the flotation outside of the flotation just inside the outer cover of the life jacket uh, the reason we have impact in jackets is it deflects the energy when you take a blunt force hit like hitting a cockpit side uh, colliding up with a motor, anything like that. Uh, time and time again, it's been proved and endorsed by ER doctors as, yeah, you really need this stuff in your jacket. We know of several cases where people who got hit or got tangled up in their equipment, the, the material saved them. Um, it's required in all outboard classes, stock mod pro J impact is in there. The only categories that don't specifically say you must have impact in your A100 jacket or OPC and vintage. Um, most of the vintage people, most of the jackets that I see at races that uh, 
that I sell to people who are getting equipment. SRP has been putting impact in an A100 jacket as standard equipment since about 2005. Uh, so most of your vintage inboard guys are going to have impact in their jacket. If they have an older jacket that they've had us clean and go through and that kind of thing, we usually point it out to them. Uh, it is an inspection point for vintage going forward that you want to make sure that people have the impact in their jacket. It's an easy check. You just knock on the uh, front of the jacket and if you can feel and hear the impact in there, it's going to be right there. Uh, if, if you squeeze it or squish it and it, you can't feel that hard surface in there, it doesn't have the impact in it. Bob? But it's not required as of what It's it's not yet, but it will be once this rule passes. Uh, old jackets can be retrofitted uh, with impact. It's a real simple procedure. Um, cost to add impact to a life jacket is $140. Uh, it's cheaper than buying a new jacket, at starting at $500. So it's, it's a good thing to have if you're driving a boat that doesn't have a reinforced cockpit because it's going to be your protection. Bob? Does that impact material go in the skid collar? No. Oh, okay. um, the second change we did was more of a change to bring the specs in line with what the industry standard is for how both SRP and Lifeline are building jackets. For a number of years, the jackets have had a thousand denier quarter and nylon on the outside and both manufacturers have been using a 400 denier thinner nylon on the inside. Uh, the spec as was written recalled, called for the thousand on both sides. Uh, we found there really wasn't a need for it. There hasn't been a failure of a life jacket due to interior material. Um, so to bring the, the life jackets in line with the spec, we, we adjusted the spec, so, so everybody's cool there. Uh, the other thing that the spec on the A100 jackets re, uh, stated was if you had impact material in your jacket, it had to have 360 degree coverage. Um, simply put, that's not possible. You have a front of a life jacket, a back of a life jacket, side panels and pieces of you know, connection points where it's stitched together. At a connection point you're not going to have impact there. Uh, you're going to have a very close but fit up against the two pieces that have impact in it but it's not 360 degree coverage. So to clarify the rule we simply change that spec uh, to read from 360 degree coverage to having front, back, and side impact, which just makes the rule a little more friendly for the user and for the inspectors to be able to enforce. So those were the changes we did to the A100 life jacket. Um, the second thing that we added last year, as most of you know, we took out helmets that were DOT only uh, approved helmets that had only been approved by DOT and didn't carry any further certification. DOT, as you may recall, is a Department of Transportation by the U.S. government spec on helmets that doesn't involve a testing procedure. Basically, the manufacturer of the helmet signs an affidavit that says, we've constructed this helmet to conform to, a, to DOT specs. Uh, the better uh, helmet manufacturers, the names you recognize, uh, are probably doing some sort of test and verification of that. There's a lot of stuff that's made offshore uh, that may or may not actually go through a DOT uh, verification that it, that it meets that spec. Uh, you can buy a DOT helmet in Walmart. Uh, you can find them anywhere. Uh, what we wanted to make sure was that the helmets people were using were going through some sort of testing procedure and did meet some sort of minimum uh, requirement for impact. 
uh, SFI, who does lots of different safety certification in competition, seat belts, uh, driving suits, all kinds of different equipment, um, is branching out into helmet specifications. And one of the things that was found was that uh, the Snell certification, especially as Snell has evolved and where we're at now with Snell 2010, it was very hard to get a youth size helmet to pass a Snell test because you had to make so much, you had to add so much bulk to the material for the relative size of the helmet, it made the helmet dangerously heavy for a kid's head to wear. Keep in mind that, that we're not just talking about nine-year-old J kids here in the grand scheme of things. We're talking about five and six-year-olds racing quarter midgets and, and all of the racing spectrum. And so what we found was that uh, there needed to be some sort of helmet spec that was developed for younger drivers. Uh, SFI working with a number of different helmet manufacturers such as Bell, Simpson, uh, some real high quality people in the industry developed a spec uh, called SFI 24.1 which is a spec for a youth helmet. Uh, and Bell, Simpson, a number of other people make SFI 24.1 helmets. Uh, the current one that Bell has is not available in orange. Actually, in conversations I had with the CEO of Bell last year, they indicated that they might be interested in making their youth helmets available in orange uh, for boat racing kids. I told them to wait until we got the SFI spec approved before they went down that road because I didn't want them to make a bunch of orange helmets and then have them uh, not approved. So we did approve the 24.1 for kids. Uh, they also have a spec 31.1 for a full face helmet, 31.2 for an open face helmet, which is comparable to the Snell uh, 2010 SA rating helmet, which is the Snell helmet with the Nomex liner and goes through some additional tests regarding side impact. It's, it's a little more robust Snell spec. There's Snell 2010 M and 2010 SA. Both Snells are approved for APBA. Uh, Bell, uh, Shuey, or Bell and Simpson and Pyrotech make an SA helmet. Shuey makes a uh, Snell M helmet. They, up to this point, haven't made an orange helmet in the, in the Snell SA, but their M helmet, which is a, a good, beautiful helmet, uh, is legal for APBA. So we, we added a few more specs for people to choose from when they're choosing helmets and we, we hope that will make things easier. Uh, the other change that was made for people who are running air systems in their boat, previously there was a, a limit on the maximum length of the hose that comes off of the mask or off of the air helmet that connects up to your main boat umbilical with Parker fitting. I think it was like a 12 or a 15 inch limit, something like that on it. Uh, there's a manufacturer who's come out with a, a newer, super flexible, super lightweight, strong air hose that uh, basically by going to a longer adaptation on that hose, we can run the Parker fitting further down and take some of the weight off closer to the head and to the mask area. So we increased the, the length on that to a, uh, to a 36 inch maximum length on that hose. So we're getting the Parker fitting further down and you know, again reduces fatigue of having the mask or the air helmet and the weight further up here. So those were the changes that were made overall. There were some category rule changes that happened too. I'm, mostly familiar with the uh, with the ones in the outboard classes. Uh, there were some issues last year regarding the radius on pickle fork tips that came out at, at the Nationals and as a result, uh, without going into big detail on that, uh, one of the things that the, the J category and, or the J 
commission group of, of classes. And uh, the stock outboard category did was adopt the Mod Pro spec on pickle forks, which is a one inch radius uh, around the, the tip of the pickle with right now what's listed as a uh, thickness of three quarter inches at the tip of the pickle. That apparently now is being further discussed by the Stock Outboard Racing Commission as to whether to, to put a, a plus or minus tolerance on that three quarter inch. They're finding with the small boats, especially the J's and the A's, that yeah, you can cut back the pickle and round it to the one inch radius, but the boat thickness of the pickle right there at three quarter inch is pretty tough to meet. So there is some review going on at that. These rules aren't scheduled to be into effect until May 1st. So I would suggest you check frequently with your local outboard commissioner or your, your club to find out what's going on on this rule in case a change does come down the pike. But, uh, but there are some changes going through on that. These basically bring the APBA rules in compliance with what's out there right now for UIM which has a, uh, the same radius on the pickles. So we're, we're trying to get everything pretty much on the same page and not have different rules in each category. Bob? Back to the helmets, uh, is it to be a gone to, you said a 2010 or the M series, is a 2000 Snell, is that still okay? Right now, there's nothing in the APBA rules that says what year Snell has to be approved. It just says Snell. That's what I thought. So I just knew it talked about 2010. Right. And I didn't know if something had changed there. So still, it's still Snell, it's still mill spec. That hasn't changed, but you were just referencing better. <laughs> not, maybe not better, but, but comparable. Okay. Uh, SFI is is another organization like Snell that does scientific testing of, of safety and industrial safety equipment. And, uh, you know, they've, they've gone into the helmet uh, testing business. No, nothing on that. Uh, there were some proposed changes, but nothing happened on that. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about are life jackets and flotation devices. Um, life jackets carry a manufacturer's rating tag on them when they're built. Uh, there's either an A, a B, or a C type life jacket. And uh, they're grouped as to what their intended use is for. An A jacket or an A100 jacket is for a driver in a non-reinforced uh, non cockpit, like I talked about earlier, the driver is not strapped in. Uh, so that's you know all your outboard classes, vintage, uh, super light tunnel, some OPCs, uh, inboard flat bottom, uh, that kind of, of class. Uh, the difference between A and an A100 jacket is the A the A jacket is for drivers who are going less than 100 miles an hour. A100 is a jacket for a drive. It's rated for speeds over 100 miles an hour. At this time, I believe all the manufacturers, both of us manufacturers, are only building jackets out of A100 specs. The, the primary difference being the Cordura nylon on the outside with the uh, A jacket. You could use a lighter material on it. Uh, I can't speak for the other manufacturer, but I know at SRP it just didn't make sense for us to buy the additional material, uh, inventory two different lines of products. It just made more sense for us to build everything A100 and give people a better product, which was our choice in doing that. Uh, the next type of jacket is a B jacket, and this is what we see the guys in uh, in restrained cockpits wearing, uh, it's most commonly known as the capsule suit, uh, which looks like a life jacket, but it has little Bermuda shorts built right into it, no leg straps. It's a step into type thing. 
Going back just a sec to the A100 jackets, there's also a jacket in that category that looks very similar to that called a torso outboard jacket or a torso inboard jacket. A lot of the flat guys wear it. Uh, some of the pro lay down outboard guys go that route. Again, it's it fulfills all the A specs except it doesn't have leg straps on it. It's got the little shorts in it and it's a step into uh, type jacket. A lot of times I've had cases where people have come up to me at a boat race. Race officials have come up to me and said, hey, that guy over there is climbing in his boat. How do we know if he's wearing a capsule suit or a torso suit life jacket? And the quick answer is have your inspector run over there because if I run over there they think I'm going to try and sell them a life jacket and that's while I like to do that at times there's a time and place for that and when a guy's climbing in his boat to go race that's not the time uh, but I will direct an inspector to go over have the driver unzip his jacket and look at the tag inside if it's got an A in it and he's getting into an unrestrained boat he's fine if it's got a B in it and he's getting in an unrestrained boat, not okay. He has to have an A jacket on it. So the easiest way to tell a life jacket apart, uh, a torso design life jacket, is by looking at the tag inside. Once you get to know the jackets and the lines, there are other subtle differences. But to an inspector, the easiest tool is to look at that tag. Um, there's also a jacket that you almost never see. It's called a, uh, a C rating. And it's basically just like a B, except it has accommodations for supplemental life support systems. Specifically, sometimes you see the offshore guys wearing a jacket that has a little holster in it for a, uh, for a spare air or you know some sort of air container on it. That jacket should be carrying a, a C uh, tag on it. At present, we don't offer an inventory at SRP any C jackets. If somebody needed a, a situation like that, we could certainly build it and put a C tag into it. Going on to the next one, uh, the A A100 jackets. Uh, must be 70% yellow or orange in color. And these are in the rules and the manufacturing specs. Um, now it must include impact material, as we mentioned before. Uh, if it has leg straps, I actually have an error there. It doesn't have to have leg straps, but if they have leg straps on it, uh, the leg straps must bear the weight over the driver's shoulder. They can't be just stitched on to the waistband around the jacket. Um, the jacket also has half offset flotation. This is kind of a, what does that mean? It's kind of a funny deal. I get people call me at the shop who maybe are, they're new to racing or it's their first life jacket in this style. And they go, hey, I got my jacket and you guys made a mistake on it. Oh, what happened? I said, well, the, float, the flotation, the padding inside is thicker on one side than on the other. That's done by design. And the reason we do that, and the reason it's required in the rule, is the intent of an A100 jacket, and intent is the word underlined bold, uh, red arrows, everything like that, is to assist in turning the driver if he enters the water unconscious face down. Will an A jacket, A100 jacket, do that every single time? It depends on the driver, it depends on the life jacket, it depends on variables. Uh, it can depend on what you ate for breakfast that morning. It'll have a large bearing on what you wear with your, uh, with your life jacket, your cut suit, your shoes. Shoes especially can make a huge difference in how a life jacket performs. That's a whole different discussion. But jackets, you should be looking at your life jacket and make sure that the flotation is thicker on one side than on the other. If there isn't, you should be contacting your manufacturer and asking why it doesn't. Um, 
skid collar. An A jacket has to have a skid collar. There's dimensions as to how tall it has to be, a uh, certain percentage of where it has to uh, uh, cover over the back of the helmet. Uh, there's specs on the color of it. Um, the life jacket also has to have a tag sewn inside it with the date of manufacture on it permanently affixed either with the date stitched in it or burned into it with a hole tag. Uh, it should not be written on with a pen or a felt pen or a rubber stamp or something like that. If it does, again, you should be talking to your manufacturer on that. Um, but those are basically what an inspector should be looking for in an A A100 jacket and how a jacket should conform. How often should a jacket be inspected? At present, APDA has no requirement or rule regarding life jacket recertification. Um, how often a, a jacket needs to be inspected from a race official standpoint, from an inspector's standpoint, at least once a year, depending upon your category rules. You know, I don't know if vintage requires it at every event or not, but uh, um, it, it needs to be looked at. Not at this time. Not at this time. It's been talked about. Um, it's just not in place right now. Yeah, Brian. As an inspector, what we look for is serviceability. Uh, yes, everybody's turning, taking it to the manufacturer once a year, just like the helmet. Uh, but it's it's condition, mainly condition. Yeah, yeah, and, and the way the rules currently are, they've, the expectation is that an APD inspector will use his good judgment and be able to look at, at a life jacket and determine if it's serviceable. The rules do state that a, that a referee can request that a driver uh, demonstrate the floatability of his life jacket. So if there's somebody you don't like, you can have them take the long walk off the short dock, and that'll work. Do you float that? <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, the next type of jacket that we see in use a lot is a Type B jacket. Uh, oh, Jan? Before you move on to that, in pros, you still have guys wearing black jackets under their A jackets. And they didn't change that rule, correct? They can change, you know, basically, the life jacket spec rule covers the life jackets used in the category. If Pro uh, says that guys can wear their flak jacket under their life jacket, they're certainly welcome to, but my interpretation is they still have to have flak in their life jacket. It's changing as soon as subject aided to board approval. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was discussed at the Pro Commission, and we I will be in compliance with this. The Pro they, Rule says black and under Yeah, black now. Okay. We'll be yeah. So, you know, I mean, and the reason it was discussed was that apparently there are some pro drivers who like to wear their old style light jacket with the flak underneath it. A couple of points there. First off, you don't get the level of protection if you do that because whatever is going to be hitting you, that energy won't be deflecting off of the impact material first. It'll be going through the life jacket and then doing it. So your impact is way less effective if it's on the inside. Um, you're, you know, it's going to be better than having no impact at all, but it's going to really reduce its effectiveness of it. So, and, and Howard doesn't race anymore anyway, so. That's a good reason why, right? <laughs> <laughs> what if you wore your flat jacket on the outside? 
then it would have to conform to the color specs. <laughs> Rick? Patrick, just a clarification. I don't know whether Kelson's got his hearing aids in or not. Well, I didn't think what? so. <laughs> Vintage is also going to have to comply with the flap inside the jacket? Yes. If they pass that rule? Yes. Well, all depends on when it's implemented. It would be 30 days after it's uh, published on the website. So, yeah, it's it's an easy fix, and I don't suspect there's going to be that many people who are going to need it. Most of the jackets that you guys have brought in uh, that I see already have the impact in it. The guys who've gotten new jackets in the past seven years, they've gotten it in there. So. I, I don't expect it affecting a huge amount of people. We are uh, type B jackets. Uh, these are the capsule suits or the capsule jackets. They must have shoulder epaulets on them for extrication out of out of the boat. They too must be 70% orange or yellow. Uh, they're required to have a flotation buoyancy of plus or minus 10 pounds, which is why it's a, a thinner material. Bob? Uh, why would you want to have minus 10 pounds? No, it's plus or minus 10, meaning 9 or 11, Bob. That's not what it says. Thank you. <laughs> um, the type B flotation may be incorporated into the driving suit as category rules allow, uh, meaning that in the import category, for instance, it allows you to wear a flotation suit or a horse collar type vest under your driving suit if you're in a type 3 or type 4 inboard uh, style cockpit, which is an enclosed cockpit. So, um, so we're seeing more people in the import category in particular um, having to wear flotation in their boat rather than wearing a, a capsule suit and covering up the names of their, their sponsors and their fancy colored driving suit. They're going this route by either having the float, if they're having the suit built new, having the flotation pockets and the foam built in, you can pull it in and pull it out. Or they wear the horse collar underneath, which is, it, I should have brought one with me. It's a little yoke device that goes over the shoulder and has the same basic amount of flotation as you would have in a driving suit. But it's, it's a separate thing that, that you can buy. And those are, those are basically the difference between an A and a B uh, life jacket and, and what are the requirements there. Are there any other questions before I go on to masks a little bit on, on uh, flotation? No. Um, there's two different types of systems that are out there for, for onboard air required drivers. There's the air mask and the air helmet. Um, air helmets being sort of the, the newer thing that have come along in the past 10 years and they're sort of the, the, the next generation of what's going on there. A um, lot of discussion about both and there are people who really love one system and really hate the other and you can be on either side of the fence. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of good points and bad points to each one and and each system has its own specific advantages and disadvantages. Uh, on the next slide, we'll take a look at those. Uh, the air mask is a fighter pilot mask uh, with a stage two respirator attached to the front of the mask. Uh, we like to say it's battle tested because it's been around on, on race boats and, and for drivers since 1986. Uh, proven over time uh, as the materials and the things that they're made out of progress they're getting lighter and more compact um, they can be attached to the helmet 
uh, either by a rubber strap that holds a whole mask on that you put on before you put the helmet on, or what we see a lot of people do is use bayonet mounts like, uh, like air fighter pilots use, uh, a metal clip that goes either on the inside or the outside of the helmet, and a, and a bayonet that, that goes in. Um, the air helmet is an integrated system, of course, of the, the helmet and the mask. They're a little bit easier to fit, so if you have a driver with a really small or a really big head, uh, sometimes because the masks are pretty much a one-size-fit-all type thing, uh, it's hard to get a mask to fit on a real small profile face. Uh, you can alleviate that problem with the air helmet. Uh, you can build the speakers into the air helmet for the radio system so that uh, you don't have to deal with the separate earplugs that you have to run in. Um, it offers better impact protection if you take a blow to, to the head or the face area. Uh, it's a dry system. Uh, people go in the water with, uh, with an air helmet on, they come out and their hair is dry. I mean, the, if it's set up properly in the neck seal and everything on that is working as it's intended to, it's a totally dry system. Uh, you have increased visibility, especially underwater with an air helmet, which can reduce the panic a little bit in a bad situation. And if you have a leak uh, with the air helmet, it's going to be, you know, obviously you never want to leak in your air system or, or your air seal, but but it's going to have a little less effect with, with an air helmet because if, if the mask is leaking, that's all you've got right there. If, if your helmet's got a little leak, maybe say around the visor or you know, in the neck seal, you've, you know, it's not a, as much of a panic situation. No, we're not guaranteeing good air. Uh, disadvantages to each system. The air mask is more sensitive to impact. Uh, it's somewhat fragile. Just with both of these systems, the thing that, that if you sit back and you think about it, they're really sort of a Frankenstein one-off creation. You're using parts from three different distinct areas to come together to build this, this air breathing device. You're using a mask which comes from the uh, aviation, military industry for, for the actual fitting itself, for the bayonet mounts, for the communications, that's all aviation parts. You're using a scuba regulator on the front of the mask, which comes from the scuba industry, and then you're using everything that holds it all together and makes it work together, which is propri proprietary material, usually manufactured uh, in small quantities, one off by the actual mask manufacturer by, by us. So one of the things that people think and that we run into problems with as a manufacturer is if any one of those parts within that little supply chain world becomes unavailable. For instance, if the Pentagon does a big run on, on needing a bunch of air masks and we can't get the bodies of the masks uh, the government snaps up everything that's available. We might go months without being able to build an air mask. Um, happens a lot with the bayonet mounts in particular. Those seem to be something that we have trouble getting. And if somebody's buying a complete system, they're getting into it. There are times when we can supply them with the mask. You know, we'll have all the materials to build the mask, to build the regulator, to build everything, but I can't get the bayonet mounts for four months and they're out of luck. So if, if you're planning on ordering an air system and an air mask, the advice is plan ahead and, and check with us and communicate with us so that we can make sure you get it in time. Um, again, a disadvantage to the mask is that they're harder to fit, matching the helmet, facial features, bayonet placements, etc., directly to a person. It's all pretty much a custom fit. I saw this a couple weeks ago at capsule training. Uh, a couple people were having trouble with, with getting a seal around their mask, so they borrowed somebody else's mask, and they may not have had their own helmet there well because of where the bayonets are placed, whether the, the bayonet receivers are on the inside or the outside of the helmet, 
how they're aligned, what angle they're at, how it all goes together on that person's head may work fine for Corey Peabody, but it's not going to work well for Ray Badger. And as a result, these things are all sort of a, a fit to yourself type thing. It's also one of the reasons why our, our safety and rescue people prefer you go testing with the equipment that you run in your boat rather than, you know, show up in with something that isn't yours or um, isn't something you would normally wear in the boat. Uh, there have been cases where if a driver takes a hit to the face, there's a greater likelihood of the seal breaking or a need to purge the mask. Uh, panic potential when you're in the boat is something like that happening. The other thing that we found is that any contact with cleaning chemicals or solvent can damage or destroy a mask just like that. Uh, the wrong chemical on the rubber body of, of the mask will dissolve the mask. So they're, they're very sensitive in that way. And with the type of chemicals we have around boat racing, um, it's, it's not the most friendly environment for that. The air helmet, its disadvantages are that it's a little more buoyant uh, since it's made out of foam and plastic and has a foam liner. Uh, it can add to the challenge of getting out of a boat. Uh, in real extreme weather conditions like Lake Lawrence at the end of uh, April, the helmets can fog or Sammamish in October. Uh, the helmets can tend to fog up. Trace, yeah. That, yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, multiple layers of shields to see through. You've, you've got what we try and do to mitigate the fogging is put a, uh, an anti-fog insert on it, uh, which is kind of like a little plastic cling that goes onto it that can take care of a lot of the fog. But, but you know, still you're looking at, when you're looking through an air helmet, you're looking through that shield, you're looking through the shield of helmet, and then you're looking through the glass of the canopy of the boat. So you're looking, you know, you're just adding that much more than if you have a mask and you're only wearing dark glasses with the mask and looking through the cockpit there. Uh, the neck seals can hold in heat. They can be real sweaty on a hot day leading to the fogging that David mentioned. We've made a lot of grounds in, uh, in what we use for the material for the neck seals. We actually, when, when Security Race Products did its mo most recent office moved and moved into Kent. We happened to move next door to the Harvey Wetsuit Manufacturing Company and went over and started talking to them about neoprene materials. And we're on a material now that is much easier to put on. It's got a, a real smooth surface on the inside so it slips on and slips off. We're having less of a problem with the fogging these days. So. You know, a, a rep if you're still having that problem, especially with the older helmets, it might be an idea to try a new seal. Bob? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment about the uh, microphones that you guys put in your masks. Mm -hmm. Both the, uh, the ones that you deliver and also the spares, yours are waterproof. And that's what I've got that I provide for Greg. But Greg was having all kinds of problems with his Fred Leland mask. And when my crew chief diagnosed it, he found out that somebody had put in a microphone that was not waterproof and it had kind of gone away. So that's something to be aware of. If, if you're going to replace the microphones, you need to get them from you guys. Yeah, we, we try and carry stuff that we know is going to work in, in our environment, and that's a big part. You, know, you can find parts for anything on eBay, uh, you know, and, and find a cheaper deal for anything, but uh, it's kind of like what Nick was saying with radios. You know, you can, you can put the pieces together on your own and come up with something cheaper, but is it going to be better? Maybe, maybe not. We had a, I love this story to tell, we had a guy come in who brought an air mask in and, and wanted us to look at it and make sure it was all right. This particular driver, who's a Region 10 driver, decided to make, manufacture his own air mask. It came out to about here. It, it stuck almost a foot out. It weighed about five pounds at the end of the thing. Uh, 
it scared the hell out of us. Um, Scott was feeling a little bad that day for, for this particular racer and took that mask and reconstructed it uh, to our specs and, you know, basically ate a lot of the, the money on the cost just because it was dangerous. It was, it was flat dangerous. It had radiator hose clamp after radiator hose clamp. <laughs> and, and it was this Rube Goldberg comes to mind with it. So the guy came to pick up his, his mask and we handed it to him and he went absolutely livid at us because we destroyed his beautiful creation. And, you know, thankfully this guy didn't have, a, frankly, didn't have a boat that went fast enough to get him into trouble where he was going to probably need a mask. The mask might, you know, his boat might sink. But, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the mask itself, if, if he'd ever gotten in a situation where he really needed to rely on it, I, I wouldn't have trusted my life with it. Um, you know, we, we gave him something that we thought was better, thinking that, that he was better off for it. He wasn't happy with us. Oh. So with that in mind, the do's and don'ts to air systems, do treat your mask system or your, your system, whatever it is, like it's gold. It's your first, last line of defense with your life. Um, don't throw it in the back of a pickup truck or in, in the bottom of the toolbox. Uh, when we sell masks, we sell them with a bag, that, a storage bag that's got a zipper on it, it's a little black nylon bag. If you lose it or you don't have one, come see me, we'll, we'll work getting you a new one on it. But, but keep it separate, keep, keep it in a place where you aren't going to be dropping an engine block on it. Uh, all of those things, just common sense. Uh, keep it clean, store it in the bag or the case when it's not in use. Test in the pool frequently. You only have to have a capsule test uh, every two years. I think it's great that a lot of our people go every year just to get the experience, not only of getting, getting out of the boat, but to make sure their equipment's still working. Um, Brandon. Facial hair can make a difference on your... Uh, on your mask CO2, said the man with the beard in the back of the room. Uh, that's, that's another thing. Um, have the system inspected annually or after a crash. Uh, we can gladly take a look at a mask uh, and it doesn't take very long for us to do. We go through it, we make sure that, that everything's working well with it. Uh, the don'ts, the masks, obviously, again, common sense of don't expose them to dirt, dust, chemicals, or solvent. Don't have them sitting out in your shop when you're, you know, spraying primer on the boat. Um, don't run an air helmet with the face shield open. Uh, you lose your air seal if you do, and if something happens, you aren't going to have time to reach up and close it down real quick. Um, you might think it does, but, but it won't. Uh, Replace a neck seal on an air helmet if it's older than three years old. Uh, they do stretch over time and, and your seal isn't going to be as good. Uh, take the neck seal off of the helmet for long-term storage, again keeping it from, from stretching and, and doing that. So in conclusion, which uh, system is the best really depends on what your concerns are and what your applications are. Like I said, some people have definite feelings about one and definite feelings about the other. Um, if you know somebody who has one system and you have the other, see if you can maybe try it out sometime. Take a look at their system, get familiar with them. Uh, they're both, they're great systems. Uh, maintenance checks, you know, how much does it cost to get a check and how long does it take? Uh, a mask, we do a check on for $75. We basically go through check all the o-rings all the seals everything that's in it make sure that that there's no signs of damage uh, go through it all and, and make sure it's there it takes us maybe a week or two to get it done this is a good time of year to be doing that i went to the last capsule training session and took uh, at least one mask back for me for a 
for a checkup, everything in it. The guy had had it for, he'd had it for three years and the person before him had had it for a few years before. To his knowledge, it had never been checked. Uh, we went through it, everything was fine on it. $75 later, it's back in the mail to him and, and everything's good. On an air helmet, we charge $100 just because there's a little more to the, the system and making sure that, that the seal around the, the eye port is, is good and doing all that. Um, it's just, you know, it, it kind of, I guess it shouldn't surprise me since we don't require Snell dates on helmets or, or life dates on helmets. We don't require uh, recertification on life jackets. It shouldn't surprise me that we don't require some sort of recertification on air systems, but I think it's really stupid that we don't, and they are something that should be looked at on a regular basis. And, you know, even, even if you're only running once a year uh, and you only get your mask out for one race a year, always a good idea to, to check it out beforehand make sure the seal is still good the mass may not have changed but like brandon said if you grow a beard uh, if you have a good winter and you eat a lot put on a little more face weight that kind of thing all these things are going to affect or if you lose a ton of weight uh, all these things are going to affect how the seal works on your mask if you change helmets uh, and you, you change your bayonet mounts, things like that, that's going to affect the seal. Uh, they're all important. So, you know, it's something that, that you don't want to find out if it's all going to work when you're upside down and dark in the water. Are there any other questions? Yes, John. I recently saw an uh, air helmet that literally had two latches that held the visor down. Is that one of your products or someone else? Was that we started doing that on our helmets. The newest ones started doing that. Uh, just because one of the hardest things and one of the hardest seals to get on an air helmet is the, uh, the face shield because it's, it's just like a hydroplane. It's got compound curves on it. And we found that we actually saw it on another uh, air helmet that was done by, by a guy who does them for drag boats and liked the idea and adapted it to ours. Is that retrofitable to older air helmets? Yeah. Yeah, we can do it. Any other questions? You can get a locking Parker fitting. Um, it's, you know, regular parking Parker fitting is, I think, $60. A locking one is $70. Uh, we, we sell and carry them both. So, you know, some people are, you know, our default is the non-locking Parker fitting, but we can certainly change it to a locking Parker fitting if, if people want that. Easy to do, just ask us. Any other questions? Nothing from Bob? <laughs> okay. Well, we need a couple of questions because the pizza isn't here yet. Well, well, we got John once. Actually, I have one more question. Yeah. Actually, for Dave. Um, you said you have Parker Fittings fail in your shop, but you can find failure. Come on, Doug. Dave, the same thing as you use in your boat? I did not. They're identical fittings, but I. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a little more paint on him. <laughs> I, I remember Kevin Ellsworth when he went over in San Diego. Um, his Parker fitting, for whatever reason, came undone. Whether it hadn't been latched correctly, but um, we've had him fail at the dock with both San Diego. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Yes. Gave me the brief. I did duct tape mine together. No. Yeah. It was Randy. It was Randy. And that's what I said. Yeah. The sheriff got it. No, Alan got it. He holds it. But. Yeah, Parker fittings, you know, they're another part that, that can fail. Um, they're made well, they're a great connector, but, you know, they, they can fail. And they, they can, if they're jarred around right, bouncing around in the boat, depending upon where they are and what they're hitting, yeah, they, they could uh, pop off. You know, the, the locking ones, are, it's just a little twist turn lock to them. Um, obviously, you have much less of a chance of that happening. You never say it, it'll never happen, but uh, 
but it certainly mitigates a, the risk of that. Where they are, what they're I, I love my air helmet, except that we would fog up in that. But you say the deck seal is so warm, you sweat, you can sweat in there, it's a hot sunny day. It's a sealed component because it needs to be sealed so that, mm -hmm. that water vapor has nowhere to go and it goes right on your. We, we should try a different neck seal on that. That might make a difference. Yours is also the second generation of air helmet. We're now on the fourth generation of air helmets. Uh, what happens, you know, and again, this goes back to the, the earlier point that we're taking parts from three different areas and putting them together to make an air helmet or an air mask. The uh, scuba regulators that we use about every three or four years, the scuba industries and, and the people who make these things at different vendors discontinue their old ones and they come out with new designs. We've gone lately to the little portable hydro type regulators just because they're a smaller footprint on the face. It isn't like having a big round regulator up here like we used to have and you see on a lot of the older masks, this is something that's about this long and about this tall and fits nicely in there and you don't have a lot of stuff sticking out and it's lighter weight and it's a, it's a neat piece to have. Well the way that connects either to the mask or the air helmet is by a little custom made piece of uh, machine Delrin that goes into a port in the, in the helmet and attaches there. So we can order in, you know, it's like anything else when you're machining a custom part, you want to get an economic order quantity once you get the thing tooled up and your design locked and ready. So we order in 100 parts, which will probably last us a good long time for the amount of mass we sell. We're cruising along just fine, and then one day we walk into the shop and we find out, oh, that regulator is no longer available. The, uh, the Sherwood company has changed it, and now they, they've got this new type of little hydro regulator. So we go and get that. Well, guess what? The hole in the regulator that it matches up to, to go into the piece that connects to the helmet, no longer fits. So we have to go back to square one. We're out of production for three or four months while we get a, a new piece measured, fit, tooled up and manufactured for us so that we can start doing it. We actually experienced that at the end of last racing season and just got the parts in now so that we can make our newest masks uh, that are available now. But this happens probably every three or four years. So it's one of the challenges of having a company, being with a company that, that does this stuff custom for a very niche industry. Bob, did you have a question? Some uh, teams have put a uh, fold-over piece of duct tape on their radio connections and their air connections just so that they don't accidentally bounce off and rattle. Mm-hmm. That and you know, there's good and bad to doing that. Uh, you know, kind of like back in the day when guys were wearing full face helmets and duct taping their shield down in marathons so they so they you know wouldn't pop up or rattle up after six or seven hours of driving and you know doesn't do you much good if you fall out in lap 30 and drown because they can't get the mask open because the snuck tape shut so you know you can do it either way you know you can you can tape a parker fitting or that kind of thing on but I also think there's yeah, yeah. There's a couple different ways you can do it. That it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about reinforced cockpits and outboards. You have carbon fiber homings. Um, Is that? No, when, I, when I'm talking about reinforced cockpits as it relates to life jackets and, and air systems, it's boats where drivers are using a restrained driver system. They may, have a, they may be in a capsule with a lid on it, or it may be open, or it may be like a Sport C, OPC boat with a roll bar, or, you know, uh, composite on the sides of it, that kind of thing. So a, a reinforced cockpit in this conversation refers to a driver strapped into a boat. That's a good point. Well, apparently they reinforced the UIM. The boats are heavier because of it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they've they've seen an increase in the boat weight. And, you know, of course, UIM, and if, if Bob Wardinger were here, he he'd go into a lengthy discussion about what they've done in the Formula One UIM boats with crash boxes and what they've done there. And, and they've made some real strides in those boat designs and, and building a safer cockpit for, for a restrained driver there. I, I'm surprised that we haven't seen some of that creep over into our, uh, our inboard capsule design here. Um, it, would, it would be interesting to see if a... I, I would be interested to see what a, a UIM crash box design would have done on the U-21 after the accident in Doha. I mean, yeah, you're still throwing a 6,700 pound unlimited on a, on a capsule, and the capsule did exactly what it was supposed to do. It saved Brian and, and uh, kept him safe, but, but, you know, it's, I'm sure they're putting a new capsule on that boat with the bent roll bar and everything else. So, but it'd be interesting to know what a crash box would have done in that environment. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. You bet.